are you familiar with the um the Irish Simpsons fans, the Ireland Simpsons fans? Yeah, I meme love their group? account. I love their stuff. I don't get it half the time, but <laughs> <laughs> when I do, I, I love it. I, I I think I follow them. I I think that they are the currently the best Simpsons meme producers online. And and yeah, most of it is stuff about like you know Brexit or or, or uh, Irish stuff. But uh, by the way, we should look them up when we go to absolutely Ireland. lift a pint. Uh, what's interesting to me, Bill, is that you know uh, I you know I've talked to fans of this show, and they're a lot of our fans are very young. They're Generation Z, and they say you know I'm a huge fan of The Simpsons, and I can't help but think you know well is your cultural touchstone different? Because are you talking about oh yeah I love the season twenty episode where they go to Atlantic City. Uh, but no, they love just those episodes from the 1990s. And they say, oh, yeah, they just still play just those episodes in syndication. I think that might be a function of those ones being so online. Like that those are the those are the elements. They're the fodder for all these memes and stuff. So you want to generate a I'll tell you for for my experience is the ki- my experience with having kids these days is that kids do not know The Simpsons very well. And I'll tell you why that is, because Fox shot themselves in the foot by not putting it on Netflix. Like this is the, like my kids and all their friends know every episode of Bob, every episode of Bob's Burgers. They've seen them all 20 times. Every episode of Futurama, they've seen it all 20 times because they were on Netflix and they would just be on in the background playing and playing and playing. Whereas to see Simpsons online, you have to go to F Fox's FX world. You got to log in with your cable providers thing and you got to watch 2 minutes of commercials at every act break that you can't and skip. And they're edited. Yeah, you know, well, TV is it anyway? I think they have they have the, the ones, but on the ones Fox, on TV. On the FX ones World. On In any case, that is, I think, prevented a, lo- a, a large number of people under the age of 12 from becoming as familiar with the show as they might be. But and what I'm thinking, Virgil, when you said that is that maybe they know it from YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do just have a few more questions here. Let's yeah, before I jump in with something. Uh, I have to ask you this uh, because, you know, we did have Mike Reese on and we asked him it, too. Uh, what can you tell us about John Schwartzwelder? I'm sure Mike covered it probably better than I could. I mean, John Schwartzwelder is a, was a very talented, very unusual man. Like you can't like, hmm. <laughs> well, I could just, for the, I'll just say the basics to begin with. When we were working there, um, he was the, he was still back in the room every day. He is an, he was, must've been probably about 50. Um, he's tall. Uh, he was a little overweight, but pretty about the same size as me. Uh, he smoked constantly. He always wore a short sleeve shirt that was like kind of a Western shirt with two pockets in the front. And each pocket had a, pa- a package of unfiltered camels in them. He would smoke. This is when you could smoke in the room. Like back in the 90s, you could smoke in the office. It was totally normal. Everybody was smoking. And he had an ashtray and would smoke all day long. Um, he's a very unusual guy and that he was. He didn't really work on any other TV shows. He worked on SNL briefly. He did wrote a couple of, a couple of other scripts, but I think his humor was a little too crazy for almost everybody except for Sam Simon, I guess, who hired him probably on the recommendation of some other guys like maybe George Meyer. Um, and he also was a just a very unusual guy. Like he never went to the movies unless it was a Stanley Kubrick movie. So he'd only go once to the movies <laughs> once every seven or nine years. Um, he didn't believe in um, – exercise except that you should just run down the block as fast as you could once every week or so. Uh, (laughs) He didn't, um, he had a huge collection of historical memorabilia. And I think this is probably why he was probably able to retire. Like he had, he would invest in things from auctions. I know he had a couple, most notably, I know he had a couple of paintings from Adolf by Adolf Hitler from when Hitler was an artist. Um, and I also know he had thousands and thousands of old newspapers from the 17 and 1800s. Um, I know that he – also because he wasn't the kind of guy who, who – who, he didn't spend much money at all. And so he, I believe, got pretty rich based on his writing 52 episodes of The Simpsons and with all the accompanying residuals. And he bought – I think it was um, not Ray Rogers' old house, but Gene Autry's old house and moved into it with all of his old um, newspapers and stuff. And his brother, who I heard had been um, injured building, uh, and been on disability – for a number of years because he was injured building the Alaska pipeline in the seventies. And so they lived together and I don't know anything about that. Like I haven't seen him since we worked on the Simpsons together. I know he writes all those books that are hilarious mm-hmm. and he does promote them on Twitter from time to time. I'm not totally sure that's really him, yeah. but it might be. Uh, 
And I think that just about covers it for John Schwarzenegger. He was always a really nice guy. What was his favorite Stanley Kubrick film? Are you, are you, do you know? I don't know. I think he was moderately disappointed. The only one that came out during the time that I knew him was Full Metal Jacket, and I believe he was moderately disappointed by that. <laughs> That's a shame. Uh, what was he like in a writer's room? I mean, did, did he do, you know, sit and do punch-ups and things like that? He was pretty, like, it's interesting because there's some guys who never shut up in the writer's room, like Conan, for instance, was in the writer's room, and Conan is always on, and, like, he's always really fun. Not to say, not to criticize him, because you want, you got to have some guys like that in the writer's room, or it just kind of drifts into oblivion. He was one of those guys who was quiet until he had a great line. So he would sit there and smoke, and then maybe he would speak once every 10, eight or 10 minutes, but it would always be the line that went in. I, yeah, I read that. He's, he wrote the script to Homie the Clown, and that pretty much aired with virtually no, you know, punch-ups or line changes. Uh, it's pretty close. He didn't really, like, I wouldn't say that his the room was his forte. It's the first drafts that were his forte. Yeah. Like, he wrote his first, like, and I think he preferred to be at home, too, especially after they banned smoking. Like, that was a huge yeah. <laughs> issue. Like, it, it was like around 93 that they, they banned smoking in workplaces, and for a brief period, they tried to get him these, those ashtrays that suck, you know, the smokeless ashtrays, <laughs> and that worked for about a day and a half. And then, David Merkin, who just really couldn't stand the smoke, was like, he should just write scripts from home. So he wrote a lot of great scripts during that time. And the thing about Schwarzwalder is, like, he's going to give you a script with 90 hilarious jokes that no one else could have come up with. It's just that you have to provide him with the superstructure that handles the emotions and the character <laughs> development. Because that's, that's not his, that's not female his forte. Character. Like, that's, that would be John Vitti's forte, for example. Yeah. And Schwarzwalder, like, so when we were running the show, we would try to give Schwarzwalder – uh, scripts that that already had that built in, or ones that didn't need it, like the prohibition one, where we were just like, "Screw it! There's not going to be any character development. It's not going to be realistic at all." <laughs> oh god, that <laughs> is one of my all-time <laughs> favorites, by the way. That's one really stands was, out in my head. That was another one that was probably I don't know seventy percent his first draft. Maybe there's something to Schwarzweller's uh, a total rejection of modernity in his personal life that made him such a, a uniquely good writer. I think like he really. If you wanted old time style jokes, he could really deliver them. And like he did, did you, have you guys ever seen Pistol Pete? That was the pilot he did. Yes, that's very yeah. good. Very funny and, and completely uncommercial. He also wrote another one, which I loved that, God, it really makes me mad because so many great pilots were written during those days, like by George Meyer and Schwarzwalder, that just 20th, just like threw right in the trash. Um, and he wrote this great one about two young, two little kids. And, and one of them was named Augie. And it was just kind of a, it was a real nostalgic kind of American, uh, you know, comedy show about two misbehaving kids. But like, it was hysterical, and it was another thing that was just obviously like went way over the heads of those executives, and they completely ignored it. Uh, Bill, I, I know we're running out of time. I just wanted to ask you a handful of questions, uh, more, you know, King Solomon stuff for us. Okay. All right, let's do it. Okay. <clears throat> In episode 3F03, <laughs> Lisa the Vegetarian, Ralph, when told to go to sleep, says, Oh boy, sleep, that's where I'm a Viking. This line can be interpreted in two distinct ways. Ralph could be saying he's literally a Viking in his dreams, or Viking here could be figurative, meaning something like virtuoso, which is correct. Okay, I want to say I didn't write that line. I wasn't even in the room for that episode. It was a David Merkin episode. But based on my knowledge of The Simpsons, I think the first one is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, vindicate it. Well, it sounds like we've got to talk to David Merkin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In episode 3F23, you only move twice. <laughs> Hank Scorpio throws out his shoes and asks Homer, ever see a guy say goodbye to a shoe? Uh, I to know which, where this one's going. To which Homer replies, yes, once. Is Homer <laughs> referring to what Scorpio just did or to a prior shoe-throwing incident? Okay. I've answered this online a number of times, but I'm happy to do it for you guys because I can be super clear. <laughs> It is uh, be disputed good. because the answer is that this, that was not in the script. A, a huge amount of the interaction between Scorpio and Homer was improvised yeah. by Albert and Dan Castellaneta. That line was not in the script. It was improvised, um, and Josh was directing them. And here's what happened. Josh and I always thought it was referring to a previous incident. However, Dan Castellaneta, who made up the line, says he was referring to what Scorpio did right then. So there you go. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, There's no clear from. answer. It's because the two sources, the showrunners and the person who made up the line, disagree. And I think given that Dan made up the line, you're going to have to, it leans toward him. Uh, my last one, and this is one I just figured out from my conversations with Matt. Yeah, when, when Virgil pointed this out, it broke my brain a little bit. 
so uh, in the like in the four golden era uh, episodes that are flashback episodes that show the evolution of uh, the family, uh, it's pretty clear that you know based on the ages of the characters, uh, Homer and Marge met uh, when they were eighteen, when they were seniors in high school or thereabouts. Uh, in the present day of the show, they're thirty five. Uh, Bart is ten, meaning that uh, Marge had Bart when she's around twenty five. And that's when they get married. A big part of Marge's character is that she's had these kind of unfulfilled ambitions, you yes. know? It's the sort of implication that, like, if this were more rooted in reality, they would have, like, had the kid when she's 18, right? right. They would have no, gotten married the thing, then. That's because she didn't go to college, and then she married Homer because she got knocked up. Right. So there's just this whole seven-year courtship Yeah. that... And, you know, I, I realize that th these are the sort of things that were that were mostly determined before your time, maybe even before they even, you know, the episodes uh, even began to air. But I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that. Have you ever felt that was a, a, a gap or just, you know, a conflict? Wait a minute. Didn't I, I can't I don't remember this. Wasn't was Marge pregnant when they got married or not? Yes. yes. But when she was 25. But I mean, only if you assume that they're 35 and I think it was said several times that they're 35, then instead of them getting together in high school and getting knocked up shortly after that they spend five or six years together maybe seven where they do not get where she's not pregnant but presumably she doesn't have a job or go to college and homer has an unspecified job uh, right. what were they doing she's still Guys, i college. have never thought about that until this very minute i don't know what i, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I do know what you're talking about, but I have, I, I can't believe that that wasn't covered in some later. It's like the fact that they never covered Jesus Christ's like adolescence in the Bible. Like, yeah. Those like, that's exactly years. Years. Yeah. it honestly just comes down to the fact that Homer shouldn't be 35. He should be in his late twenties. Problem is that just doesn't scan. Right. Right. For a guy who looks like him. they do actually. And I, I found this out, uh, totally by by happenstance, uh, they do actually cover it in a later episode. The one where they retcon it and Homer becomes a grunge musician. Oh wow! Okay. <sighs> ah, we we we've, we've discovered an error in the <laughs> Simpsons. No and we're so happy right now. No canon. No canon. Also, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Time. Like those, I just say that those guys are doing yeoman's work in trying to craft this era where Homer was born in 1985 or whatever. Now, like. I, Jesus Christ! When we were writing Homer, he was writ he was written like our parents, and our parents had been born in the 1930s, you know, <laughs> and so like they like he was like sitting. The prototypical Homer moment for me is like Homer sitting alone in the car, going do 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 do, do singing little Spanish flea to himself, <laughs> which is something that only our parents would have done. And, and and like my dad is 90 years old now, so like I think we were really writing Homer as someone really should be in his 80s or 90s now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm excited for the next flashback episode that shows how Marge rose up through the ranks of the DSA and uh, Homer is a, a famous Twitch streamer. <laughs> Perfect. I think that about does yeah. it. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much for uh, talking to us, Bill. Bill Oakley. Guys, th my pleasure. Th thank you for enlightening us on uh, fast food and also for helping to create uh, probably the all-time greatest television show ever. Yeah. Way to go on that. Good, Thank good you. Work. Kudos. Good work. Kudos, Kudos Bill. Thank you. Well, you guys all know, and I'm sure your listeners know where to find me on Twitter and on Instagram if they like fast food reviews at that Bill Oakley. At that Bill Oakley. Not this Bill Oakley, <laughs> but that Bill Oakley. We Correct. will include links in the show description. Once again, Bill, thank you so much for talking to us. Till next time. It's my pleasure. One, two, Bye. Three, Bye, -bye guys. Four.